Welcome to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out with Julie Caraccio. Every Tuesday at 1 p.m., Julie interviews experts on all areas of clutter, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Learn easy-to-implement tips on how to release clutter and get organized to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. An award-winning professional organizer and coach, Julie also shares suggestions to help you live clutter-free for a more joyful and fulfilling life. Soothe your soul with our customized aromatherapy blends designed to support you in clearing clutter. Our unique blends include Space Clearing, Zen Mind, Serenity, Awareness, Natural Awakening, Loving Kindness, Gratitude, Forgiveness, Blissful Balance, and Present Time, which will become your favorite. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Learn how to identify and clear out the clutter in your mind. Then it will be easier to clear out the clutter in your home, office, and life. We're opening up the archives for an interview from Reawaken Your Brilliance. Hey everyone, what is conscious order? What is mental clutter? If you're trying to lead a more spiritual life, how can clutter be affecting you? We're going to talk about that and much, much more tonight. Annie Rohrbach has been a professional organizer since 1987, working primarily in homes and home offices. She has lived a busy and full life as a mother, grandmother, community volunteer, event planner, trained spiritual counselor, entrepreneur, and author. Annie loves teaching and inspiring others to experience more clarity, peace, order, balance, harmony, joy, and freedom in their lives. She's become an expert at helping people simplify their lives and make conscious choices about what to let go of, what to keep, and where to put it. Her highest vision is to bring a lighter, brighter energy to the planet and greater peace to the world. Annie wants people to be happy and feel better about themselves and their surroundings. She wants her life to work. Welcome, Annie. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to tell everyone a great story. I belong to Annie and I met through LinkedIn and I saw her book and I was like, oh my gosh, conscious order. She totally speaks my language. I have to talk to this woman. So I wrote her and I said, hey, would you like to be on my show? And I said, look, it's just 10 minutes if I don't know you just to feel comfortable. We ended up talking for like an hour, just completely hit it <laughs> off. We're going to talk all good stuff tonight. And after reading her book, it is now my go-to book to recommend to people. But let's get started. What is conscious order? When you say that, what do you mean? By that I mean when we are more aware, when we're more conscious of where we are and where we want to go and what's keeping us stuck and why we're not getting there, when we become more aware of all that, when we become more conscious of that and learn some tools, we can create the order and peace of mind that we desire. Fantastic. So what made you decide to write the book and talk a little bit about your background because you have an interesting background although you're an organizer you're also a, a trained minister spiritual counselor I want to make sure I say the right thing what but what prompted you to write the book um, I had been an organizer for many many years and uh, a lot of people kept saying Annie I have such a hard time getting rid of things I have so much and I simply can't get rid of it uh, and it's so hard and so a colleague and I were doing some personal and spiritual growth and learned some principles and tools, which we combined into our experience as organizers. And we created a class called Letting Go and Lightening Up in your mind, your home, your office, and your life. And we started teaching this back in 1999 and kind of were making it up as we were going along, but it became so powerful and people were so transformed by looking at their clutter in a different way, by looking at themselves in a different way. And they kept saying, you've got to take this out into the world. It just means the world to us. And I taught it for many, many years and taught other organizers how to facilitate the classes. And then one of my mentors said, you know, Annie, you must write a book. It's the gift that the world needs. So it was such a joy to be able to integrate my expertise as an organizer for 25 plus years and my spiritual beliefs, which I chose to mainstream the book. So it's languaged in a way so no matter what somebody's path is or where they are in the path, uh, they're able to get the message and use the tools. 
No, it's interesting. I just posted on my personal Facebook account on Monday because every year I do an annual purge. And uh -huh. I, started, I started a little early this year because I was working with a client and it kind of motivated me more because it was a very intense job. We were doing the entire home. And within two weeks, it was done. And again, maybe it's 15 minutes here, half an hour there, 10 minutes. But what was interesting to me is the response I got on Facebook. And people were like, oh, my gosh, what a great idea. I'm going to share that. And, and it started this great conversation. And so I think it's so important because if we don't do this regularly, it just builds and builds and builds. And, I mean, let's talk about mental clutter for a moment and how having that around affects you mentally, physically, spiritually. Well, when you think about clutter being um, stuck energy, if you will, if you think about clutter and how it affects you emotionally, spiritually, it's, it's, it's so draining. And the more you have, the more draining it is and the harder it is to get started. It's very overwhelming. It can create a lot of shame and discomfort and, um, and really get people so stuck that they don't know where to start. And so once, and the reason that I believe in starting with the mind is because our mind is cluttered with so much stuff, all the things we have to do, all the regrets from the past, the, the things, plans for the future, all of that kind of thing. There's, you know, the, the things we're bombarded with every day in conversations and with the media and that kind of thing. And so when our minds are going 90 miles an hour, when we're, um, just so, you know, that monkey mind, that busy mind, that, oh my gosh, how am I going to ever get this done? I would have too much to do. All those things that we keep telling ourselves just keeps perpetuating that clutter in our mind. So my approach is to identify and clear out that clutter uh, in our mind, because then it's easier to clear out the clutter in our home and our office and our life. Can you maybe give some examples of how mental clutter is maybe kind of sneaky and that people <laughs> might not realize, oh, wow, you know what? I never thought of it from that perspective, but that really is mental clutter. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the key for me in, in the mental clutter that I especially encourage people to identify and look at and monitor is all that stuff we tell ourselves, all those I should be able to do this. I can't do it. It's too hard. I'll never get organized. All of that self-talk, which is sabotaging, drains us. So part of my approach is to, to, to find out what that is and pay attention to it and then start replacing some of those old thoughts, that old language that drags us down and keeps us stuck and replace, and I think we might do a little exercise tonight if you'd like to, Absolutely. Where, where we can start replacing those old thoughts that have kept us where we are and not moving forward to thoughts and words and things we say to ourselves that encourage us and move us forward and uplift us. Now, organizing is all about making decisions, and that's where a lot of people get stuck. And it's kind of ironic that I ended up having an organizing business because I was called the indecisive one in college. <laughs> yes. Do you feel that it's the mental clutter that causes people to become indecisive and that's where they get stuck or the... Uh, very much so, but I, wanna, I don't want to gloss over the fact that piles of clutter um, are, are piles of postponed decisions. Organizing is about making decisions. And it was Barbara Hemphill, who's one of our veteran organizers and former president of the National Association of Professional Organizers, who first introduced that concept to me. Piles of clutter, whether it's paper or stuff, are piles of postponed decisions. You know, what is it? What do I do with it? I don't have a place for it. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't want to deal with it. So you put it aside and you put it aside and you put it aside. So, so from my perspective, if you can clear, I think the mental clutter gets in the way of making decisions. Anything that makes us feel awful gets in the way. And most of that is, in, is, is, is mental. So if we can clear out our mind and have a clearer, so there's more space in there to get clear on what's important to us and, and what we really want to perpetuate, what we want to experience, then it's much easier to make those decisions and decide what to keep and what to let go of and, and um, you know, begin to, fee to, to um, alleviate the burden of the clutter, alleviate the shame, the embarrassment, which is also draining, and alleviating the fear, you know, all, there's so many things tied to clutter, 
Um, so, um, yes, a clearer mind makes a clearer decisions, which creates clearer spaces. And less clutter. All right. Now I want to remind you, if you have a question for Annie, you can chat it and I'm more than happy to ask her, or you can call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype, Skype computers, 2K voice. So you just briefly mentioned this one thing that I really like that you ask people what they want to, one, for their space to look like, but what they want to experience in their space to help them. And why do you ask that? Well, one of the first thing I believe that if we, you know, it's sort of that end in mind type of thing, literally end in mind, but I like people to try and, you know, picture if they can, if they're visual or sense or feel or imagine or think about you know, how not only what would the space, what would they like the space to look like, but how they feel in that space. One of the reasons I chose to work in people's homes is because people get so stressed out at work or in their volunteer work or out in the world or with their families. And I want to make sure when they're at home, they create environments that are nurturing and peaceful and helping them uh, restore and renew rather than dragging them down further. So I like to get them to have a picture because that uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Bernard Beckwith, who was in The Secret and is one of my longtime teachers from a long time ago and still is. He used to say, the pain pushes us until the vision pulls us. And that just really hit home because the overwhelm, the shame, the I've got to do this, I, you know, pushes us. But there's something about having that vision, having that feeling of how you want to be in a space, how you want it to look, that can really pull you towards action, that can pull you in a direction, get you unstuck, and really help you experience the harmony, the joy, the beauty, the peace, the order um, in your surroundings. Now, you talk in your book uh, about the power of choice. Yes. And one thing that I say often on the show and often in light is we always have a choice. Every single moment, we always have a choice. Some people say, no, I'm stuck in my job. I can't stay. And, and I'm like, no, you're making the choice to stay. And I think that that's a big uh, perception that sometimes when people have that aha moment, and I'm talking from personal experience, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I do have a choice. So talk about it and uh, how you talk about it in your book. Well, I, you know, you just, you know, at every single moment of every day, we are making choices whether we're conscious of those choices or not, you know, whether to get up and what to dress and what to eat and where to, where to, which direction to go, wherever we're going, uh, what to listen to, who to be with. There's cho I mean, choice, 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 choice. And the nice thing about making choices is if you feel like the choice isn't the right choice, you can always make another choice. In a very, in an instant, you can make another choice. And I think one of the things I love about the concept of the power of a choice is if, if you have in the past, consciously or unconsciously, kept choosing words that deflate you, thoughts that keep you stuck, this is where you can turn things around. I mean, one or two thoughts can change your whole experience because you're changing your attitude, you're changing your direction, you're energizing something else. Absolutely. Now you talk about why do we need to know what's important? Because a lot of times I think people say, oh, you know what? My family's important, but that seems to maybe get down, shut down on the priority list or my job's important, yet you spend more time at the gym. So a lot of times we say X is important, but we do Y. So talk about that. Well, there's two things that come to mind as you're asking that. And one is I've had a lot of clients who, you know, all of a sudden everything's important. And, and they have a hard time even discerning what's more important than something else. And once we know what's important, and I, I often like to use the values list or the what I call qualities of God list, the peace, the joy, the love, the order, the balance, the harmony, the freedom, and all my favorite words that my daughter, you know, teases me a bit about but totally supports. Um, it's, it's just like once we... Um, once we recognize, like a few years ago, balance was really important to me. I was way out of balance in terms of giving all of my time to other people and not taking care of myself. And I wanted to have that be in better balance. So in that moment and during that period of time, balance was a very high priority to me. It could, you know, and so I, every time I was making choices and making decisions and asked to do something, 
it gave me a guidepost. It gave me something to align with. It gave me something to help me decide to choose whether I was going to do something or not do something. So uh, if a, a family is really important, you know, making sure you focus more on family. So, you know, there's lots of if or, if organizing is really really important to you, then have that be your high priority in terms of creating more order. You know, you just mentioned a moment ago about joy, peace, and happiness. Uh -huh. Do you, I found the more spiritual I get, it uh -huh. is very challenging to me. I mean, I've, I've never had clutter. I've never owned a ton of things, but I've just found it's just, it's almost like I can't think of, and if I'm in a very cluttered environment and I just seem to be going through this process of wanting to get rid of more because that seems to me to bring more peace. What are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with you. However, different people have different levels of comfort. Some people don't like to have anything out, don't want to see any clutter at all or any, you know, they want their nothing on their desk. Other people, I'm very visual. So I, I have a lot of things out, although as I go through my various layers of shedding and decluttering and having fewer things that are important to me, things are becoming less important to me, and it almost doesn't matter what's around me as long as it's in order. Uh, but different people have different levels of comfort. So um, I don't know where I was going with that. That's all right. But do you think is perhaps as people get more oh. aware, more conscious, that then the need for more items around them subsides a little bit more? I think when, especially when they recognize that a clear space creates more peace of mind. I think that kind of perpetuates another clear space and another clear space. And there's, yes. So I think peace of mind is totally, that's one of my main passions is for people to have peace of mind. Even if there's chaos everywhere else in the world, we can still have peace within us and go come and take that out into the world. I love that. Let's talk a little bit about goals and intentions. <laughs> Um, that's one of my favorite topics. I think, you know, I was very goal oriented for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, a goal to me is something very measurable, very specific with an end result in mind. And then one year I just, I was, went to some workshop on goals and I just didn't even want to listen. It was fascinating, but it was about the same time that I was learning more about the power of intention and one of the things I, you know, especially like with New Year's resolutions, we set these goals to lose X number of pounds or earn, uh, you know, $1,000 a month more or whatever, you know, whatever those goals are, get organized. And then we, you know, all of a sudden we're fall off the wagon and we're back where we started and we have the same resolutions year after year. To me, intentions um, are much broader than goals. And in, and they're, where goals are more about doing intentions are more about being and and um having a greater experience it's a it's less limiting so um let me give you an example you could say uh, i want to um i'm a goal get the garage organized by the end of the summer well that's great and it could be very motivating and it could work and if you chose instead to say i want a greater sense of order and peace in my garage and my home, that's a much broader concept, but it could create a, a, a situ or a, a mindset, if you will, that you might want to, in addition to, to creating the order in the garage, you might do the shed and the closet and pretty soon you want to do the drawers. So it gives you a more expanded. If, if uh, finances was a, a something, if you wanted to set a goal of making X number of dollars by the end of the year, if you instead have an intention of a greater experience of abundance and prosperity, yes, you could earn that extra money, but you might also be getting extra clients and you might have a book deal and it could be much more than just that one goal. So that's, and, and for me, an intention is, a, is a, another thing to be in a, is very powerful. Um, Deepak Chopra had a wonderful, learn to harness the power of intention and you can create anything you want. I, I love the work of Deepak Chopra, and, and that's something. Uh, so I, I will usually, the, there can be goals within the intention, but um, it's something that I find to be very powerful. I love that. I'm in the process of making that switch. 
uh-huh. and being more and setting intention and having it brought to me now still doing the work right. but not focusing on the path of how it gets done or being open to surprises you know the show was never part of the plan and yeah. it's something that I love so being open to to what's out there but I wanted to ask, what's a reminder space? <laughs> it's one of my favorite things that anybody, anybody, I, if you did nothing else but created a reminder space, that would be wonderful. T- pick a p- p- space in your home or office um, that's, that, that you see often. And then I just have everybody cl- you know, just clear it off. Just t- take everything off of it. It almost doesn't matter in this moment where it goes. But just take it, clear it off, clean it off, out with the old. And then if you're, if horizontal, if, if horizontal spaces are magnets for you, uh, I might suggest that you commit to keeping that one space clear. It could be the kitchen counter. It could be the top of your dresser. It could be the floor next to your bed. It could, whatever it is, but just keep it clear and have a commitment. And every time you walk by that, you can say, I'm learning to have uncluttered spaces. I'm, I can have clear spaces. If Horizontal surfaces aren't quite that big a magnet. You could choose to just have one or two objects in that space representing the qualities. Um, If you wanted more clarity, you could have a crystal vase. If you wanted more beauty, you could put a rose in the vase. Uh, My daughter, when she was looking for a relationship, had two of something on her space. You can call this, I, I usually call this an altar space, but I was mainstreaming this to a a reminder space or an affirmation space. But every time you walk by it, it's a reminder, remind er that you can do things differently and that you are beginning that process. So it can be very powerful and effective uh, if you choose a space that you, that you usually pile stuff on and um, really commit to, and just, just play with this and try it, see what happens. I love that. And the other thing you talk about in your book that I think is a really useful tool is a mind map. So can you tell people what that is who might not be familiar? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool uh, to take a lot of information and put it into a, a format um, that is workable, for, especially for those who are visual. Sometimes it's, it works really well. I've done a, I, I often will do a mind map with a client. I will ask them. I start with a center uh, of, a, of a piece of paper and ask them what, how, what they want to see, how they want to feel in their space and what they want to look like. And I write down those qualities, uncluttered, cozy, beautiful, uh, nurturing, inviting, whatever all those qualities are. And then around the mind map, I will write down the different spaces in there. And I work mostly in homes, so the different spaces in their home. And then we use the mind map to write down, you know, in the kitchen, uh, the cupboards, the pantry, the whatever, in the um, in the garage, da 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 da, in the bedroom, da 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 da. So it's a way of capturing uh, a lot of the projects, and they can use that as a guideline. But at the center of that, which I often draw a heart around because I'm very hearty. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that before. Anyway, um, it, they they use it as a guideline because it helps it. They start each project with those qualities that are part of the vision of what's important to them and what they want to experience. So I use it in that way. You can use it for brainstorming. You know, just getting thoughts down without any particular order. It's it's very effective, and I have a lot of samples of them in my book. Um, one thing I loved in your book, you discuss about living in the past and present and fear and how that relates to everything. So talk a little bit about that. Well, um, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, was a very powerful book for me because it kind of validated what I had learned through my own growth. I mean, there's, you know, the, you can't do anything about the past other than what you're thinking about it and how you respond to that or how you hold on to that or how you view it. Um, You can't do anything tomorrow yet because it's not there. The only time you can do anything, the only time you can make a choice, the only time you can take an action is in the present moment. And so I really encourage, and there's lots of tools in my book about getting into the present moment. And it's a real, it's a real challenge sometimes. I, I also want to just say something to me, it's not black and white either or. If we can be in the present moment 10% of the time, that's better than none at all. And pretty soon as we practice, oh, yes, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to react that way anymore. I want to look at this differently. Then then pretty soon it's it's 20% or 
you know, even 50% of the time, because that's where the power is. That's where the action is. That's where the choices take place. And our mental, our mind can run us way back or way forward and into, you know, chaos. So that, you know, and there's so many wonderful ways to get into the present moment. No matter where we are, we can take a deep breath. Um, one way that I liked uh, when I was writing my book, I lit a candle. That was part of my ritual to bring in the light, to remember where my ideas were coming from and to keep it light. And uh, there was only one day when I had a hard time writing and I, and I was just like, well, this is interesting. If nothing's flowing. And I realized I hadn't lit the candle. So, you know, wow. so, but, uh, so, but that the candle kept, keeps me present. I, I have a candle going when I'm teaching classes. Um, I often will suggest to my clients that they light a candle when they want to do their organizing projects. But taking a deep breath, we can do that driving down the freeway. Um, so that's a great way to get into present moment. That's where the power is. That's where, that's where we make the choices that make a difference. I love that. I recently monitored my thoughts for 24 hours and I thought I was going to go insane. And so where I really try, I'm going to try that lighting the candle. I like that idea. But what I found if I'm mowing the lawn or doing dishes, that's a really good time to monitor my thoughts because I'm physically doing something. Cause I used to think, Oh, you know, I'm pretty positive. And I'd see like, wow, you know what? You were in the future. Oh, you just went to the past. And so when I'm doing mundane things now like that, I try to really use that time to monitor or stop myself. Okay. Where are you? Are you in the present moment or is your mind somewhere else? Yeah, doing the dishes is a great example because, you know, we're usually doing the dishes to get to something else. But if we can do the dishes to simply be doing the dishes and notice the suds and notice the water flowing and another great place to, uh, you know, I guess we're getting into meditation here, but in the shower, using the shower as a metaphor for washing away anything that doesn't serve us and bringing in the energy to, uh, to uh, move us through the day in the flow of things. Talk a little bit about fear. How does that affect clutter and organizing? I think fear is one of the greatest blocks to getting organized um, because it's so draining and so debilitating and can be so paralyzing. And yet fear is a very natural part of our heritage in terms of our makeup, in terms of fight or flight or, you know, keeping us safe. But I, I think the thing about fear is if we keep resisting it and pretending it's not there, it's, it sticks with us and keeps us more stuck. So, you know, what, what kind of re, what we resist persists. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I suggest, whether people are afraid of uh, an organizer coming in and making get them get rid of everything, which is not the case, um, or uh, afraid that if they get organized that they'll, it'll go back to being disorganized or afraid they'll never get organized or afraid uh, it won't, they won't be able to maintain it. I don't know. There's lots and lots of fears. Mm -hmm. Um, if they can say hello to that fear, if they can, you know, even go so far as to embrace it, it has less power because it's sitting there niggling at us until we say hello to it. The other thing about fear is it can be a messenger. It can help us. Um, it can take us to a place where we might be able to dig deeper to find out why we're so stuck in something or why it's so hard to get rid of things. And sometimes if people are extremely afraid, I suggest that they get some counseling uh, because that could be a fear far more deep seated than simply being afraid of they'll never get organized. So, but so like I say, fear can be very powerful. The other piece I would say is I totally believe that what we focus on increases. So if we focus on the fear to an extreme, the fear kind of gets perpetuated. If we focus on the clutter and only focus on the clutter, that can stay stuck. I love what Wayne Dyer says. He says, if we focus on what we really, really don't want, fear, clutter, whatever it is, then we're going to get more of what we really, really don't want. By the same token, if we focus on what we really do want, we're going to get more of what we really do want. So if we focus on the order we want to create, if we focus on the peace of mind we want to experience, we're going to start energizing that. So again, we're always a choice. If we're, if we're going down one road and we want to go down another, we, and we want to switch gears or switch thoughts, we can be more mindful of what we're energizing. And just, you know, do I really want to energize fear? No, I want to energize hope. I want to energize order. I want to energize um, harmony, freedom from all this. 
So uh, um, fear becomes so paralyzing that I really encourage people to pay attention to it and then see that there's light at the end of the tunnel and that they can get through that fear. Would you mind if I share an experience that I had with a client that might help people that's kind of, um, cause you're saying, say yes to the fear. I was working with a client and there were a stack of, of papers and I said, okay, what's this? And she said, oh, those are things I'm gonna send to people. And I said, well, okay, well, how long has it been here? Two years. So as we continued the conversation, what she figured out is I'm saving these to send us to people because if I don't stay in touch and send them things and they won't remember me and then they won't love me. And when she was able to voice that, she wow. was like, oh gosh, that's nuts and was able to let it go. So it's kind of doing that legwork you were talking about earlier and she faced a fear, realized, you know what, that's not a legitimate fear and then, then got rid of it. Yeah, that's great. You know, the simple act of saying hello to something can allow it to disappear, allow it to dissolve. It's pretty amazing. Can you maybe give some questions if someone's like, okay, I'm ready to purge some things, but if they're really challenged, like, oh, I don't know if I want to let go of that, what questions would you suggest to them that they ask? Are you talking about things or papers? Well, either, whatever you'd want to contribute. If they're, well, if they're like, okay, okay, I'm going to uh, declutter my home and but I'm stuck, I really want to purge, but I think I need everything. What would you say? To well, there's there's a lot of, lot of questions and suggestions in my book, but my four favorite questions to ask um, are, are this, it, especially for things. This would be for objects. Is it useful? Is it meaningful? Is it beautiful? And more importantly, is it life enhancing? If there's a teacup from your great aunt so-and-so and you didn't like great aunt so-and-so, you might want to let it go. Uh, if you, you know, and, and the other part of this is how much do you want, I love to have people create spaces for things. I can, uh, I can have as many books as will fit in this one bookcase or these three bookcases or whatever they have room for, you know, creating a container for things. Uh, in this cupboard, I have this much room for vases. In this space, I have this much room for clothes. Um, and that can sometimes be very helpful. The other thing is so many people hold on to things because it used to be very valuable to them. It still may seem to be valuable, but if they think that if they think that somebody else would appreciate it and value it, I oh I often will suggest have destinations in mind before you start going through your things because either for a favorite charity or a friend or a neighbor or a, a women's shelter or a you know a whatever where if you knew that somebody else could use one of your twenty coats or ten of your twenty coats. You might be more likely to give it away because you know somebody else will appreciate it and value it. That can be very helpful, picking, picking destinations. All right, outstanding. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Annie, chat it, and I'm happy to ask, or you can call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype at Computers 2K Voice. Now, is there maybe an exercise that you could lead us in? You have lots of wonderful things in your book, but if there is one that you want to share with the audience tonight. Well, because we've been talking about what's going on in our mind and, and our thoughts and what we say to ourselves, I don't think I use the word self-talk, but so much of that is so sabotaging. Uh, it would be fun to do an exercise. Um, I just, if you take a few minutes just to pause, take a deep breath. And I just would invite those who are listening to, um, as you ask yourself these questions, what, what are you saying to yourself or what are you thinking? Um, when you look at piles of clutter, your clutter, when you trip over something because it's not put away, um, when you can't find something and you know you have it somewhere, you just can't find it and it's taking to, you know, what, what happens? What do you say to yourself when you see and uh, think about all the clutter that you have and trying to get organized and it's not any fun? What do you say? I'm going to be quiet here. Just write down a couple of things that you might say to, that you do say to yourself. And I want to remind everyone, as because people can listen on the phone, this is recorded. We'll be able to send you a link afterwards, so don't do this while you're driving. But we'll give everyone time to <laughs> that, and you you will be able to listen to it again. Okay. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to share, but oftentimes, uh, I guess we're I'm not sure about that, but so many times people will say, "I'm so ashamed of my clutter." 
you know, and I, in, in this exercise, I might ask you to, to, um, to put a title at the top of these thoughts. These are the old thoughts. These are the thoughts that drag you down, that keep you stuck. You know, and I, if I, you know, somebody would say, well, I'll, I'll never get organized. You could change that to, I am getting organized. Just the idea that you're listening to this is starting the process of your getting organized. Clients often will call me and before I get there, they started organizing because that energy is already in place. So um, I'm, I should be able to do this is a huge, uh, shoulds are destructive. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like shoulds are, the shoulds feel like they're coming from outside of us, imposed on us, on us by other people. I suggest changing, I should be able to do this to I could do this because that means that you're at choice. You're, somebody else isn't choosing for you. So that's a big one. If you have any, I should be able to do this in there. What's the matter with me? What's wrong with me? Um, I can't let go of anything is a really good way to stay stuck because if you keep telling yourself you can't let go of anything, then you're probably not going to let go of anything. So I'm beginning to let go. I'm learning to let go. I'm learning to make choices so I have less clutter. But, you know, you can kind of, play with that and see what works in your own words. I'm just giving you some examples. Uh, I'm so ashamed of my clutter uh, could be, I'm letting go of the shame, you know, and that's anything you say after I am is very powerful. Um, it, it can perpetuate whatever you say afterwards. So that's where changing those old thoughts, those old, I'm trying to think of some other examples. I don't have enough time is one that many people say I've set up myself. Yes. So I have this little candle sitting here. There's plenty of time and each moment counts. So, you know, we, we can't do time 24 hours from now. We can only do time now. But if we keep telling ourselves we don't have time to do this, we're not going to make time or take the time. Can't make time. We take the time. Um, anything else you can think of? What what goes through your mind? Oh, you don't have any clutter. <laughs> Well, you know what? No, I mean, there are challenges. Like I laugh. I get hung up on beauty samples because I'm a sucker. If you walk by the counter, oh, this will take a wrinkle away. I'll try it. And so that's something I have to keep on top of because that can get cluttered really easily. And so what I ask myself is, does this represent who I am or who I want to be? Which could be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. So yeah. use it there's, that there's way. So, yeah. there's, you know, part of this is just paying attention. I would encourage people to just monitor for the next week or so when you're, what your thoughts are and, and, and see if you can create a new thought that makes you feel better. Because when you feel better about yourself and you're telling yourself nicer things that make you feel better, it's much easier to, 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 to create the order. It's much more fun. People say, how can it be fun to organize things? Well, I love it. And I get my patient, my clients to uh, have fun too. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Got to keep it light. Yes, no, absolutely. I think that's so important because as you point out, a lot of people have shame or fear or whatever it is around that and they think they're going to be judged and, you know, none of us want to be judged. Right. Well, and I don't want to diminish that shame or fear or embarrassment right. or whatever either because it's very real and there's a way to work through it. Saying hello yes. to it is part of it, but there is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There is, you know, there is a greater possibility. Absolutely. How could we look at clutter from a different perspective? Um, I'm not an expert in feng shui, but I've learned enough about it from colleagues and classes. Um, feng shui can sometimes help us, and this is on a very beginner's level, uh, but uh, feng shui is the art of placement, um, the art of the flow of energy uh, in spaces, and different spaces have different um, qualities, relationships, prosperity, this kind of thing. And sometimes if there's clutter only in a few spaces in somebody's house, I will see that um, there's a lot of clutter, for example, in their relationship corner, which is the, if you're in the room, it's kind of the far right corner. Um, and so I discovered that there's problems with their relationship. And so when we move the clutter out of there, um, it seems to get that moving better. 
So that's one thing. And again, that could be a whole separate session, which I think you've done for sessions on feng shui. Um, the other thing that, um, that I have found, um, I truly believe that there is something greater than we are. Uh, whatever you want to call that, source, higher power, uh, divine presence, universe, whatever. And when we recognize that that which is greater than we are is full, is, is about infinite peace, infinite harmony, infinite joy, infinite love, freedom, beauty, all my favorite words, mm-hmm. um, then we can tap in. We can tap into that because we're part of it and it's part of us and it's already there. We just need to wake up, be more conscious of it and allow it to come to us. Uh, it, it takes away the efforting. We certainly can take action, but if we allow that greater source to to inspire us, to help us clear things out, to give us more creative energy, um, I think that that can be very powerful. I agree with that um, completely. Now, let's jump. I want to add on to that because at some time, at point in your book, you talk about this. What do you mean when you talk about the power of the mind? Well, I think that's basically what we've been talking about most is that our mind is a powerful tool. And I think that when we recognize that it's our mind that creates the thoughts, that creates the words, that creates the beliefs that limit us, it's also the mind that creates the beliefs and thoughts that expand us and, and give us a, con- a greater concept of what's possible and what we are able to do and what we're able to experience. So, you know, when we think a certain thought, it creates a certain experience. If we like that experience, keep that thought going. That's, you know, but if we don't like that, that experience, our mind can help it. And there's, I have wonderful research in, in my book about the brain and how the brain works and how plastic it is and how we can create new neural pathways and synapses and connections and all that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, it's very exciting because it's so true that we can, with our mind, we can change our experience. With a new thought, we can have a new experience. I love that because what I think is so great I love your entire holistic attitude because organizing is very structured and very, I always get them messed up left brain, whereas you're bringing in a completely right brain concepts to help kind of meld them, which, which I think is fantastic. And one of the things that I find really attractive and I was being sincere when I said at the beginning, you know, you're now my go-to book for people. If I'm like, this is when they're saying, well, what would you recommend? Okay, here's your book. Thank Go you. read it and, and start off with that. What would you say is a big challenge to staying organized? So if someone's cleared their clutter, they kind of have something in place. What are the challenges that people face? Well, I think there's several. Uh, I think there's a fear that it might get back out of order. So that, that fear can drive them, can push them into what they want to continue to experience. Uh, uh, sometimes I've encountered, um, worked with clients where, the, the clear spaces, the uncluttered spaces are so unfamiliar to them that it's very uncomfortable and can be very, um, I keep, I sometimes will say this could feel very disorienting and, but I'm very careful to, I don't create the order. I ask questions to help that and facilitate their process of figuring out what works for them. I really encourage people to tune into their own gut, their own wisdom, their own guidance, their own intuition, whatever you want to call all of that. And, um, and really be, you know, mindful of what is going to work for them. Um, Yeah. I want to talk a little bit and we'll talk about something that your, your project you're working on me with, but how do we simplify our lives more? Um, some of the things I really like that you talk about in your book were finding balance, self-care and planning. So could you touch on each of those? Well, simplifying for me was focusing on one or two or three qualities at a time and balance and self-care were two of my main focuses. I love Cheryl Richardson's work, uh, Take Time for Your Life. She's one of my favorite guides in terms of extreme self-care. I used to say, you know, I spent the first 50 years of my life taking care of everybody else and now I'm learning how to take care of myself, which I think as women, frankly, that that can happen. So, so um, 
simplifying for me is if we if I can take care of myself better, I'm going to be better at everything else I do as a as a mother, as a grandmother, as a daughter, as an entrepreneur, as an author, as a friend, as a volunteer, as a colleague. Uh, so um, and and that makes my life simpler because um, because I I have a focus. Well, now my focus is service, but it's also but I take care of myself in order to serve better. So, um, and that's that's a simpler thing rather than thinking, well, I've got to do this and this and this, and I've got to have all these qualities, and I've got to have all this together all the time. That can be very. I used to be really good at making things very complex, and so I'm getting. Re- I am getting much better at simplifying and making things easier. Um, there's a quote that a friend sent to me several years ago. She goes, ease and grace, ease and grace, ease and grace. Some things are worth repeating. <laughs> so just even something like that can, can encourage, you know, if you find a favorite quote or a favorite uh, uh, mantra like that, that can inspire you to simplify. I have, a, um, I have something up on an altar that I see from my desk that says the art of simplicity. It keeps me focused on simplifying. And I think that, again, if we're mindful and conscious, it's easier to simplify. What would you say to someone? Because I think you're right. As women, we always seem to put everyone else first or have a challenge into saying no. So if someone's like, wow, that's a new concept to me. I'd really like to do that. What's maybe an easy first step that they could take to practice to get into better self-care or saying no? Um. Be willing to put yourself first. I was trained to never start a sentence with I and never put myself first, was grabbed from I run to the front of the line. And that's a long story. You don't need to get into that. But, Uh you know, giving yourself permission to put yourself first could be a huge first step. And that might just mean taking doing something first thing in the morning, the first part of the day that that is about self-care, whether it's taking a nice long shower or uh uh, a bubble bath or meditation or reading something inspiring. Um, I think that that can really um, set the trend of, of self-care and simplifying. And talk about planning because that was something else that you had talked about in your book. Well, um, planning, I mean, there's all kinds of statistics that's how much time you save if you plan. One of the, my favorite tricks, not only to keeping track of things, but you know, there's maybe 20 projects that we have in mind or hopefully written down. David Allen, Getting Things Done, says, don't keep it all in your mind. Put it on a, make a list on your computer or smartphone or on paper. Um, but if we can keep all that clear, um, and I just lost my train of thought. Isn't that fun? Had 17 different, have you ever had that happen? 17 different ideas and 17 different tracks. Um, what was the question? I had it earlier at the beginning of the show with my reawaken you thought. So don't apologize. It happens. Julie, <laughs> Julie, Hello? Julie, you have a call. Okay, we have a call. Okay, hi, who's this? Hi, this is Janie. Hey, Janie, what's your question for Annie? Um, I, my front entryway, which would be the mouth of the key, my front door. Um, the minute you open the front door. It's probably four feet wide. There's walls on each side. And right when you walk in the front are two folding doors that hold the furnace and the water heater. And you can go to the right into the living room, dining room, or you can go to the left into a bathroom and a bedroom. I mean, but you walk in that, it's probably a four foot by, or maybe a five foot by four foot space when you open the door. I mean, there's no place to hang a mirror. There's it's bifold doors with the slats. The energy just stops. And I don't know how to make it flow. Do you open those doors very often? The front door? No, the little doors that hold, that hide all that. No. They're closed all the time because they have the, and right behind that, I mean, it's, my house is a circle. So the furnace and the water heater and a closet are right in the middle there. Okay. What if you, you know, it's so important to have something when you walk in your house, if you or when other people walk in your house, that makes you feel good. And obviously that doesn't make you feel good. I'm glad that you recognize that, become conscious of that. 
I would find a beautiful piece of fabric. Look at the fabric behind Julie uh, or, or something that makes you feel good. It could be a tapestry. It could be um, uh, something that's easy to move. You could even put it on a rod so that you could swish it to the side when you have to get into that closet. But if you hardly ever get in there, I would put something there that makes you feel good. Color, uh, colors that make you feel good. Um, a batik or something. A batik comes to my mind. But you might just explore, go through the fabric store and see if you find something, or look online uh, to see about okay. a tapestry or something. Does that would that work? Yeah, it works. There has to be airflow in there. That's why there are slats in the bifold doors. Okay. But I suppose so I could really hang... thin, you know, fabric. Even gauzy or swishy or goddessy or something. <laughs> I, I would or I would crystal. look for something because especially if you have fabric, then it's going to go floor to ceiling or at least cover up those doors. Um, I just want to make sure it makes you feel good because it okay, sounds right. like that's maybe really I, depressing. Maybe I can hang crystals off of the slats of the louver doors, like forky crystals. Ah, uh huh. Would that yeah, work? Could, yeah, I, again, a feng shui person could probably answer it better than I, but you just want to have something that doesn't stuck, doesn't get into your mind and gnaw on you or irritating. Uh, that's another part of mental clutter. I've noticed the energy that people spend being annoyed or irritated, either at something they see or somebody's behavior, that can take a lot of energy out. So if you can, especially, do you walk in your front door most of the time? No, no, no one hardly uses the front door. Um, uh, and uh, really, um, because the driveway is another mouth to the G and it, it, you walk through the carport and go around to the back door. Um, uh -huh. People will, you know, like a US, UPS guy will knock on the front door, but no one ever, and, and consequently, I have no visitors ever. Do you want you visitors? Um, yeah, sure. It, you know. It'd be fun to just play with a few things. Play with some okay. concepts. I mean, if, do, would you like people to come in the front door? Um, yeah, and the sidewalk leading up to it is nice, and I mean, So it you just know. hasn't felt very welcoming. Yeah, it something isn't something isn't welcoming, and then and, and that sounds yeah. like it's bothering you. So I would find something welcoming. Okay, sounds like a good idea. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> thank you for calling. That's great. Got to get things that, that that you know. It's almost like you stick the energy. You know, it's the energies, uh, the the thoughts in your mind and your responses to it, which are very real, um, can stop your energy, or you know make you feel stuck she's gone okay well thank you jane if you're still listening and actually we interviewed a feng shui expert same state as annie out in los angeles who talked specifically about the front of the house so you might want to listen to that interview and there might be some suggestions i love annie's about putting a fabric there and that that's a great one but that might be something you're interested in annie could you maybe share a client success story of someone that you worked with and maybe how working on conscious order helped change their life? Yeah, I thought of, I thought of somebody uh, who I had, had wanted to work with me and kept putting it off and putting it off. And then she had to move from this absolutely gorgeous home with a view of San Francisco Bay. And she was furious that the owners were going to sell and she had to get out and she found another place and she, it wasn't as nice as her first place and she would win a year and she wouldn't get things unpacked anyway. So she finally called me at the encouragement of a friend that I work with. And she said, Annie, I just, I'm so stuck. I don't like this place, but it's the best I could find. I'm so angry. And she would just hold, this is a year later. She's still holding on to her reaction and her sorrow and grief at having to lose, you know, leave this other space. So I was there for about four hours and I listened and listened and listened. And I said, well, could you just show me around? And so, I mean, she has, she's, she's an artist and a musician and she had beautiful things and had a real knack for arranging things. She had, but she had boxes all over the living room in the front hall. And so she was showing me, she said, oh, here's this and here's that. And I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And, you know, here's the, you know, kitchen door and here's the window and I looked out the window and there's this beautiful view of this garden and you can see the bay distant she'd never even seen that anyway so I just oh and I was complimenting her on how beautifully she had arranged the 
pottery collection that she had. And, you know, I was just kind of starting to point out things that I saw that were quite beautiful. Sincerely, she has a real knack. So, so then we, she says, oh, well, you know, but how, I mean, this is, I just, it's just so hard. I can't do this. I said, well, let's take a break and have some lunch. And so during lunch, I asked her how she'd like to, this space that we were in the living room where there were boxes and there were boxes in the entryway you know, what did she want this space to look like? And she gave me some words. And how do you want to feel in this space? I want it to be welcoming. I want it to be cozy. I want it to be artistic. I want it to be comfortable. You know, and and she kind of started, I said, well, what if we started, you know, if you started, if that's what you want, I did a little mind map for her. Um, I think we could create that. Do you want to unpack these boxes? Well, I started at, you know, in the morning, we took a break for lunch. And for, you know, in the course of four hours from the time I arrived to the time we finished, we unpacked all those boxes. She was so excited. She knew exactly where everything was going. She knew she where she wanted to hang the rest of her pictures. And she said to me, this is really fun. You know, <laughs> so like from being such a drag and so caught up in the past to being open to exploring a new way to look at this and a new way to think about the vision holding what she wanted to to experience in this space and she wanted to have, be able to have people over and she hadn't had people over. And, you know, all of a sudden, four hours later, she's like, this is amazing. I love this space, you know, and she, and I, you know, thank you so much. So it was very, it felt very good. And, and she was so troubled when I started and her mind was so at peace when we finished. So that felt really good. I love that. Now there are a couple of questions I like to ask each guest. The first is what advice would you have for someone who's struggling right now? Maybe they are surrounded by clutter, or they're going through a divorce or lost a job, what words of wisdom would you have for them? Transitions are so hard and such great challenges for, and I often say to people, if you haven't done something yet, it could be because it hasn't been the right timing. And that can sound like an excuse, but when we're in the right frame of mind, then it's easier to do things. So you know, even to just take a baby step of instead of saying this is hopeless, I'm never going to get this done, to just say I'm going, I am beginning to get organized. I am learning how to, uh, I'm going to clear this one space. And there's something about clearing one space, and whether you keep it empty or just put one or two things of meaning on it, that will that kind of shifts the energy, and pretty soon you want to clean another space because you like the feeling in that first space. So, you know, just to clear that one space might bring, you know, even if they don't understand it, they don't, even if they don't think it's going to work, be open to the possibility that it might work. Um, I love the, I, I love playing with words. And if you look at the word impossible, it also, if you look at it from a different perspective, it says, I'm possible. <laughs> okay, excellent. We had our great hallelujah sound effect there. Now, the other question I like to ask people, you've given us lots of wonderful tips tonight, but what one step can people do right after the show, before they go to bed, or tomorrow morning to reawaken their brilliance? Oh, take a deep breath, connect to that source, connect to that within you that's so powerful and so filled with infinite peace and love and joy and freedom, and just know that you'll be guided and inspired to clear that one space and then another space and then another space, and that you're fully supported all along the way in whatever, how, whatever that means to you. And being able to get something done that makes you feel good will allow, will free you up to be able to to recognize more fully and really reawaken your brilliance because you are the light is there and it can shine brighter and brighter and I really um, see the light in everyone and know what's there for you I love that now tell people how they can buy your book if you have any upcoming classes or anything that you'd like to share with everyone um, my book is available on Amazon uh, it's also now in the Kindle and the Nook version. On Kindle, you can go through Amazon. Nook, I think you go through Barnes and Noble. But there are there there's links on my website. My website is uh, www.consciousorder.com. I'm just in the middle right now of creating the 2013-2014 workshop schedule, and I also, um, if you'll sign up on my website for my for my complimentary newsletter. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to create some study guides 
for the materials in conscious order and start teaching online, hopefully in 2014. We're about to move. So right now I've got a, my, my highest priority is uh, getting things in order to move. So, uh, so that's going to put off my uh, workshop and study guide creations till probably the first of the year. But keep track and there's lots of tips and things in there. And uh, hopefully inspiration. My book has lots of quotes and inspire, inspiring ideas and t- Hope you enjoy it. Your soul with our customized aromatherapy blends designed to support you in clearing clutter. Our unique blends include space clearing, Zen mind, serenity, awareness, natural awakening, loving kindness, gratitude, forgiveness, blissful balance, and present time, which will become your favorite. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Thanks for tuning in to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. Sign up for our newsletter and receive a free copy of 10 Clutter-Free Living Tips. Ready to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire? Learn about Julie's coaching, e-books, online monthly decluttering classes, how to organize your life, office hours, and her unique clutter-free living mastermind at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. You can also watch all episodes on YouTube or download on iTunes and more. Join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step.